this week. The race for digital primacy in Africa. Global technology firms from the US and China see a wide range of opportunities in Africa's digital future. But who will ultimately drive the continent's so-called digital coming of age? And what are the economic and political implications for African countries and their citizens? We'll also have a sit-down interview with a man who wants to be the next president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Martin Fayulu tells us why he has been touring North America and why he wants all eyes on the 2023 election in the DRC. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome. I'm Haiti Adams. You've probably heard it said before that Africa is on the brink of a digital transformation, a sort of tech revolution that is likely to reduce poverty, improve access to education, jobs and social services, and boost growth and development in the region. Today, six of the world's 10 fastest growing economies are in Africa, and global technology firms see significant commercial potential in expanding internet connectivity and digital infrastructure in the region. Region. But who is shaping the digital landscape across Africa? Kenya, for example, is a leader in digital innovation on the continent. But the East African nation has also become a battlefield for tech giants, primarily from the US and China, all vying for digital dominance there. Juma Majanga reports for us from Nairobi. The digital revolution is sweeping across the globe, and Africa has not been left behind. With the world's youngest population and the lowest broadband connectivity at only 22% according to World Bank data, Africa presents the biggest digital frontier. Technology has been used to ensure that what human beings cannot do better can be enhanced through technology. And it has really facilitated communication. It has made it possible for us to do the impossibles in terms of how we engage with our, with our fellow human beings, with the machines, and the environments at, uh, as a whole. Kenya is known for groundbreaking digital innovations like the M-Pesa, yes. a digital mobile phone money transfer technology. But the country continues to rely on technology imports from countries like China and the US. In 2021, Kenya imported $1.19 billion worth electrical and electric equipment, according to the UN Comrade database. Behind technology, America is very, very key, but China is shadowing them because of the robustness and the availability and how they engage us and the aspect of helping us own some of these products. I think the technological war between China and US is really hurting African states in the sense that uh, we are being told to choose one from the other. And you see from the African continent or from the African perspective is that uh, we go for what is accessible and then what is cheap. The enrollment of the fifth generation network in Africa has been hampered by the rivalry between the US and China. If you look at Google among others and in terms of uh, the growth of the, techno the, the technological, the generation network, first generation, second, third, three, four, fifth among others, these are American ideas. And it is true that because of the war between Huawei and America, it has not been rolled effectively even here in Africa. Kenyans have varied opinions on the origin of the technologies they use. So I really have to care where my internet is coming from. Because first of all, uh, I need to value my security. I also have to value the cost and even the capability, or I can say the quality of the internet that we're getting. Honestly, I don't care where my internet or the technology thing comes from because there are people who are in charge of it. The same same way when you come to a restaurant, you don't care how the food was prepared. You just eat, say it's delicious and walk. That's the same same way with me. I use it, it was perfect, it didn't hang, and I walk away. For tech for entrepreneurs like Kevin Omondi, so see, it's, it's the growth of their tech ventures is what concerns them the most. To go to. As a young startup that we are actually, we, we lack the funds. And then the awareness whereby if an, an application has been developed, now what we need is the 
the funds for us to be able to make this market roll out these markets widely so that it's also accepted and then apart from that is the is the education that we also need because you find that uh, we don't have the good education systems compared to the western countries like maybe china or uh, or us the interruptions of the global supply chains by covid-19 and russia's war on ukraine has laid bare the risk of relying on imports and as developed countries scramble for digital frontier in africa experts say africans should strive to build and develop their own technologies juma majanga boa africa news center nairobi so why are companies from countries outside of Africa vying for digital supremacy in Africa? And what does this battle mean for you and your freedoms and the technology you use? Also, what is at stake for your country's economic and political future? Well, joining me now to discuss this is Dennis Matanda. He's a chief executive at Morgenthau Sterling, a trade and investment firm here in Washington, D.C. And joining us from our studio in New York is Abu Bakar Idris. He reports on technology and business for rest of the world. Gentlemen, a warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, I'm going to start off Thank with you, you here. Uh, what does digital primacy in Africa entail? I mean, uh, give us an idea of what it looks like. I, I think that we, we, I think we, need to step, we need to step back and ask a question. Are digital firms really making a beeline for Africa? Or is there just an opportunity to take advantage of in Africa. But let's, let's look at it from this perspective. There are over 700 million people in China right now that still need to be satisfied. Every single day that goes by, there are adoptive and adaptive people in China who are willing to take advantage of the technology. And lastly, if you look at what they call the 14 five-year plan that the Chinese government actually implemented, it is not necessarily for other people it is for the chinese because that is the strength of the chinese market the chinese market is strong because it has some of the world's most adaptable people it's actually a reflection that china is a developing country albeit being a very rapidly developing country so for china to have primacy in africa that's mm. for china's benefit yes that's absolutely for china's benefit but i think that I, I will now come back and answer your question properly which is why are they coming to africa it's because africa has a young population and africa still is a frontier of uh, the, the next development until Africa has enough road networks. And I think that my colleague uh, Idris wrote a brilliant, brilliant paper on uh, road networks uh, and the rail networks in, uh, in Nigeria between 19, I think 60 or something. If you look at it from that perspective, there's a direct relationship to digital supremacy in Africa. Well, clearly, Abu Bakr Dennis did his homework um, on you, uh, but can you help us understand China's digital silk um, road? Uh, how vast is it? How sophisticated is it? Because as I understand it, it, it's meant to provide aid, political support, and sort of other types of assistance to recipient states. But what does it entail? Right. I mean, China has been building, um, developing its digital Silk Road for a long time. And in, on the African continent, it has basically entailed supporting Chinese-owned companies that are operating on the continent, helping them with not just resources to grow, but also partnerships with the government and w w with businesses and governments in this region. And so there's been a lot of, um, you know, um, um, conversations and partnership between Chinese-owned businesses and the African governments and businesses on the African continent too. And they've done this in different ways over the last few years. And But at the same time that, you know, all this is happening, I think what is also critical is to remember that um, Chinese businesses on the African continent, Chinese tech businesses on the African continent are still relatively small compared to the, the U.S. and European behemoths that have massive footprints in this region. So for China's own businesses, it, the plan is to improve their footprint in this region, and it has done so, and is still doing so with partnership with governments.
Uh, Dennis, this is your wheelhouse. What, what is the, the impact, the larger impact on issues like infrastructure, national security, trade? When you have this kind of race for digital supremacy, how does it expand into these other sectors and areas? It, 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 in, in very simple terms, for me, it basically says or suggests that the war for digital supremacy in Africa is going to be won by the United States. And now let me make it from this perspective. If you go to an African country and look at what China provides. To the government, China is going to provide some of its very advanced artificial intelligence on facial recognition, on blocking certain elements of social media. And so the governments will import this sort of technology. Go at it from the other side. What does the United States export to African countries? It's probably going to be Facebook. Uh, Google. TikTok, Google, whatever it is, that social media technology. And if you listen to the report that you had, Huawei has been having major challenges with its 5G because of a very simple agreement by the United States or the United States private sector saying we will not do anything with a particular brand. But then there's another very big difference. There is a huge difference between the people who go do business in Africa from China and those from the United States. Now there is Baidu, uh, Alibaba, and Tencent from China. It's called the BAT. They are private sector entities going ahead to do work. But behind those entities is government money from China. Correct. The United States, all these global behemoths, how much of a percentage does the US government have as shares? almost 0%, in fact 0%. Perhaps uh, you will find pension funds that have put their money into these entities because they are publicly traded entities, but there is no real connection. So from that perspective, there is a chance that the Chinese will go much further, but is that sustainable? Right. And that is the point. So it's this connection yes. um, to Beijing mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. not necessarily a connection yeah. to Washington Absolutely. on the, on the yeah. other hand. Um, we're going to take a short break quickly. I want you both to stay with me. We'll continue our discussion here on the other side of the break, straight over Africa. We'll be back in a moment. Bring the continent every day from east to west, north to south. That's VOA Africa 54. We bring you the latest news and development from Africa. Politics, health, tech, and everything in between. We're on it. Our network of reporters and analysts are on hand to add perspective to all our reports. Join me, Esther Githu Ewart, Monday through Friday, right here on VOA's Africa 54. Well, you're with Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. And we're discussing the race for digital primacy in Africa. I'm with Dennis Matanga here, a trade and investment expert. He's a chief executive at Morgenthau Sterling and Abubakar Idris, a business and technology journalist who writes for Rest of World. Um, Abubakar, I want to come to you. We've been talking about sort of back end battles here, but then there's also the front end of things. Um, does whoever have digital dominance at any particular time also have the ability to really um, interfere in a country's political and economic affairs. Right. I, I think the conversation about um, you know the front end of technology is basically one of the most interesting topics for me right now because when you think about the front end, it's not just how a phone looks like. It's not just how the apps are arranged. It's not just also what the interface um, of the app looks like. It's it's a bunch of other things. It's a, it's all the way down to how the algorithm suggests content for you. It's all the way down to you know what it's what it's picking up about your interest. How you're scrolling on the phone. How you're scrolling on the screen. All those things play key roles in how they in how technology is developed, in how people are thinking on the back end about how to make stuff better for the African consumer and for consumers as a whole. And so when you think about it from that perspective, the front end itself is a huge chunk of the of what drives technology in today's world. And so um, it's it's something that people are paying attention to. It's basically also um, you know how people are thinking about how to improve and and basically um, 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 what's it called to um, redevelop how Africans are basically using technology and you know interfacing with all this all this innovation on this part of the world.
Uh, Dennis, China, for example, has been criticised um, for censoring media, for censoring free speech and monitoring and re restricting social media. Um, is it providing governments on the continent with sort of high-tech censorship tools that could be abused by repressive regimes? Mm -hmm. So I, I want to answer it from two perspectives. Let me talk about it first. For, for, for are, are people that don't speak English or French or Luganda or Swahili, mm. the Chinese need to receive a lot of praise. They speak Mandarin, Cantonese, and they have been able to make such inroads into the African Absolutely. continent. So let's talk about it from mm. that perspective. That is huge. My friend Paul Nantulia, I've, been, I've known Paul ever since uh, maybe 1988, we shared a dormitory, and he is one of the foremost experts on this, and he has written a brilliant number of papers on what they call the Guangxi system that the Chinese deploy in Africa. They basically do not just develop a front-facing tool. So like Idris was talking about, it's not just about the technology on the front. There are relationships that are in the back of the systems. And if you look at every single level, there is a national security uh, aspect, there is a social economic aspect, there is a political aspect, and then related to that, there is a profit and profitability aspect. This is not conspiracy theory. I think that uh, Idris captured it very well by saying we cannot just look at it from its uh, front dimension. It is a multi-dimensional aspect. So digital supremacy is actually supremacy for livelihoods. Uh, and is this exactly what we do not want, is to be more coupled with a foreign power? We always talk about how neocolonialism, we don't want to see colonialism ever again. We need to decolonize. But if your, um, if your country has your cloud computing is connected, your digital infrastructure is connected and controlled and owned um, by a foreign power, doesn't that fly in the face of what African countries want in terms of de in independence? What do African countries want? African countries want want a fully functional continent. If you look at the African Union's uh, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, there is a digital component. There is an aspect of relating with Western. So if you go back to the non-aligned movement of the 1960s, uh, 50s, it's not about who can we decouple from or who do we... There is no going it your way anymore. In fact, if you look at how China has been very successful, go back to 1978. What China did was imitate every single thing. Go look at the Chinese technology, the Chinese infrastructure from 1949 when it got, in, when it got its basic, basic independence. It has been imitating. It imitated the Russians. It imitated other people. But if you come at it from that perspective and saying we have to decouple, the reality is Africa needs to be a part of the global community. And one of the reasons why Africa still attracts less than 5% of foreign direct investment is simply because it is not as deeply integrated into the global system. The point is that if you look at global supply chains and distribution networks, they are dependent on technology, Western technology. If you want to look at something that I'm very passionate about, it is tariff rate quarters or sanitary and phytosanitary standards. A country like Namibia has enough beef to export to the United States, but if it doesn't fit the technology required to get to the United States, its beef is a colossal waste of time to the Americans. I, I see that point. But look how to that the point Dennis just made. W what are African countries doing or what should they be doing to develop their own technologies so that we can be part of the global, you know, part of the global community, but at the same time be less reliant um, on other countries outside of the continent? We have about a minute and a half for you. Right. I think the first thing is a lot of African countries recognize that they need to be pragmatic as they deal with this whole conversation about digital sovereignty between especially with the escalating um, tensions between the U.S. and China. And so they're very, very pragmatic about how they go about it, what exactly they want to pursue, what kind of partnership they want to, they want to support. Um, and that, by, that being said, many of them also recognize that they need to build and develop the local tech ecosystem. And so they've been developing something called the Startup Act. 
in places like Senegal, in places like Nigeria, there have been strong push by the governments in these places to introduce things that are called the Startup Act, which is basically a way to kickstart development of technology businesses in this part of the world. And so, to an extent, they've been fairly effective in terms of how they've introduced this um, this, this new um, government legislature. But to be seen, the, 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 this new act hasn't really propelled uh, much um, technology innovation. But at the same time, the governments have also been trying to be open in terms of enabling um, um, introduction of um, investment, foreign direct investment into tech startups in these countries. And so we've seen the, the growth in venture capital to this market by virtue of how the governments in these places have stood back and also supported the businesses that mm -hmm. have emerged in their various markets. And so places like Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa have seen a boost in venture mm -hmm. capital over the last few years. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'll have you both back on the show again soon. Dennis Matanda, Chief Executive at Morgenthau Sterling and Abubakar Idris, a business and technology journalist. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me. I do thank you for okay. your time. Well, after a short break, our newsmaker interview with Martin Fayulu, who says he wants to be the next president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's been down that road before. He'll tell us why the 2023 vote will be a turning point for the DRC. That interview is next. breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back. Congolese opposition leader Martin Fayulu is on a tour of North America and he is calling on the international community to keep an eye on the 2023 election in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Fayulu is hoping for a rematch with current President Felix Tshisekedi in his bid for the nation's highest office. However, the election process seems to be on Fayulu's mind. He spoke to VOA's Jackson Mbunganye. I remember the last time I spoke to you around 2018, right after the elections, spoke during the elections and then after the elections. What do you believe happened during the elections? Why are you not president? I'm not president uh, because Mr. Kabila didn't want me to be the president. Mr. Kabila uh, wanted to hold the power, uh, what he did, and uh, he appointed someone who could agree totally uh, with him and uh, that, that's happened. So you did not have the opportunity to lead the Congolese to be president but you've been very active in the country's politics. What have you been working on? What are you doing these days? Uh, we have to prepare ourselves for the next election. I'm teaching, I'm educate, uh, educating Congolese, telling them that all issues we are having in the Congo, poverty, insecurity, all those issues are due to uh, the uh, lack of uh, legitimacy. We don't have institutions and the leaders who were you know, put in place by the Congolese people. Uh, elections are going to take place in the DRC. Uh, are you planning on running again? And if you do, uh, what are you doing to make sure that what happened in 2018 doesn't happen again in uh, 2023? Yes, I'm planning to run because uh, Congolese want to see me there. And uh, if they tell me that you have to stop, okay, I will listen to them. I'm trying to, I, I will run, and what I'm doing, uh, since day one, after the fourth result, I uh, ask uh, everybody that we have to go and 
change uh, things in the Congo and uh, have reforms. And I propose on uh, May 10th, uh, 2019, um, you know, a solution, you know, how to get out of that, the crisis. What I proposed is every stakeholders, all of us, we have to sit down together and agree on some institutional reforms. The reforms of the Electoral Commission, the reforms of electoral law, and some others. And uh, we have tried, we have made proposal on all uh, those reforms. And uh, today, uh, what we continue to do is to tell people that tomorrow, please, pay attention. Your votes should count. And after voting, you have to stay in the poll station and wait until they issue the result. Mm. If the result is not correct, you have to demonstrate. And nobody will come again and steal your vote. So you're saying, Congolese, take ownership of, of your process and your elections uh, to make sure that whoever you elected is actually the person in uh, the seat of power. What is your expectation from the international community? Yes, I'm telling Congolese, yes, do that. But I'm telling also the international community, you have to do your part. Like the U.S. here, the USA has pledged $23.5 million for the next election, this, which is good. But by doing so, uh, the USA has engaged his uh, responsibility, you know, his engaged, uh, you know, his reputation. And uh, that means they have uh, not to wait until they give the result. They have to follow. Uh, to scrutinize the electoral process. Mm. And if there is something wrong, if something is derailing, if someone wants to derail the process, the electoral process, I think the USA and the other member of the international community, they have to come and put sanction, take sanction to those guys. Mr. Fayulu, 2023 is coming. You are likely, I mean, you're, you said you're going to run. Uh, if you win, what are some of the top priority areas for, for your country that is coming out of, a, of this pandemic? My uh, priority is, first of all, to build the fundamentals. Those fundamentals are prerequisites for Congo. This is a country which respects the law, okay, state of law. And uh, secondly, the country with its integrity, total integrity. Congo should remain one. Thirdly, a national cohesion. All of us, we should be one, have a cohesion, working together for the prosperity of Congolese and our country. And the last one, the fourth, is the integrity in governing the, the, the country, what some call uh, good governance. I call it integrity uh, governance, okay? If we have all these four prerequisites, then we go to some uh, priority, which are education, which are uh, uh, agriculture, because we have to feed our people, which are infrastructure, okay, and electricity, water, and so on. Mm. But the first thing is those pre, uh, prerequisites. Well, the DRC is Martin Fayulu. They're speaking to my colleague, Jackson Mbunganye. And that is where we leave it for this week. Thank you so much to my guests and all our reporting teams who contributed to this week's show and to our affiliate stations airing Straight Talk Africa across the continent. From our team here in Washington, thank you for joining us on television, radio and online. We appreciate you always watching and always listening. And I'll see you next time. Do take good care. Goodbye. <laughs>